At the Mama Bear Initiative, we go deep into the why, the when, the where, and the who of protecting those we care about, our cubs, the people who depend on us. We explore how to protect ourselves so we can protect them. Do you want to protect yourself and those you love, but don't know where to start? Well, we all have a mama bear in us. She's right there in that instinct to defend and protect. We like to get down to brass tacks on how to stay safe in many situations with logic, wisdom, and knowledge. We will give you strategies, tools, and techniques for navigating tough situations that require a little self-defense and protection. Join us on this podcast to get the confidence you need to stay safe, make good choices, and protect yourself and those you care about. My name is Stephanie Dunham. I am a middle-aged mom who lives in Newark, Delaware with her sister, husband, and son. And I am a martial artist. I have a school here in Newark, Delaware that I run. And we meet twice a week for about an hour and a half each week, or each day, rather. Right now I have only female students. Uh, I started my martial arts journey in January 2016. I started uh, a martial art called Nimpo Bugai, which is not a well-known martial art, unless you're already a martial artist and know about the ninjas. <laughs> in which case, you may or may not agree with what we're doing, but I don't really care. What I care about <laughs> is that uh, I enjoy the martial art and I enjoy teaching it. And mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned... It's just as good as any other. Absolutely. So I started in 2016 and um, I was immediately thrown into the deep end of the pool. And I had to learn a lot fairly quickly. And I received my first test probably about a month after I started. We'll talk about nerve wracking. <laughs> and then my second half of my first test about seven months later and accelerated to black belt within four years and after I received my shodan which is the first degree black belt I was offered the opportunity to run a school here in Newark being what's called a dojo cho which is a dojo leader in Japan I didn't accept right away I felt a little bit scared of that mm, being right. in charge of you know teaching people this I won't say it's overly complicated but it's fairly complicated martial art to right. teach also to learn it's fairly intense um, and so the weight of the responsibility was kind of getting to me but I decided after about a month after talking, I think, to you guys, to my husband, mm -hmm. to a couple of other people that I was going to go ahead and accept. Yeah. Why not? <clears throat> I'm always up to a challenge. So I accepted, but that was after the pandemic hit and everything was shut down. <laughs> right. So I had to wait for a little while. And as we got closer to the fall, I started to wonder uh, what I was going to do when I opened my doors. Like. I didn't have any students. <laughs> it's hard right? to be a dojo cho when you don't have anybody to teach. <laughs> so true. And it just so happened, my sister, the one who lives with me, was talking about thinking about starting Nimpo when we were driving back from a shopping trip. And I said, well, you could be my first student. <laughs> and she said, yeah, I, I could be my, your first student. <laughs> so... I opened my doors in September 2020 and had my first student and, you know, we've grown a little bit since then. I'm not particularly interested in having a huge school, at least I'm not at this point, but I'm, you know, pretty satisfied with the amount of students I have right now and what we're doing. So I've been Dojo Cho now for three years and I really enjoy it. So I intend to get my need on which is a second degree hopefully sometime in 2024 
I've had some setbacks recently physically, so I haven't really been training as much as I would have liked for the past couple of years, but things will be set right soon and I'll be able to get back into it. So I'm going to pass the proverbial mic to Rochelle <laughs> Knapp, my sister, uh, and let her talk about her NIMPO journey. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. So as Stephanie said, I started in September of 2020 as her first student and did not know I was getting myself into and felt like I was had two left feet and all thumbs for a long time. It was difficult, scary, felt overwhelming a lot of the time. And it still feels that way a fair amount of the time, but I am at least more familiar with the techniques and concepts that I'm learning. And it's done a lot for me personally. It's helped me to grow as a person to understand myself better. And my ego is constantly challenged. And humility is a lesson I learn every time we have a class, pretty much. Probably one one of the most difficult things is the persistence it takes to stick with something like this. Not something I've ever done in my life, or at least not a whole lot. And I both love it and hate it at different times in my journey. But I have a deep understanding, or at least a deeper understanding of what it means to persevere in something that's difficult. And I can see myself doing it for the rest of my life. And if, at least as long as my body will let me physically do it. And I love the spiritual side of it because it correlates with a lot of my own beliefs and is just harmonious with how I see life and how I'm learning about myself. Um, and it's just really cool too. Are you getting emotional over there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am because I've had, have found some deep roots in NIMPO, um, deeper than I expected in myself and just in the practice of it. And it's something I've actually come to love quite a lot, even though it's really, really hard a lot of time and can be frustrating and a little bit scary, but I don't want to give it up either. Yeah, no, I yeah. completely get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. So the other person in the room is Evelyn Mason. Uh, she's my best friend. So effectively my sister. I yes. often refer to her as my twin because we're so much alike. Mm -hmm. Although we don't look anything alike. <laughs> what? No, I'm sorry. We're not identical no, twins. we're not identical. <laughs> but sometimes it's a little scary close to being identical <laughs> twins. Scary in a good way. Well, sure. If you like. <laughs> At any rate, uh, Evelyn is here, and why don't you go ahead and tell us about your experience with NIMPO? Sure, Steph. So with me, um, as a kid, it was always, you know, for me, it was always uh, other kids that took karate. That was the big thing. You know, when we were little, if you took a martial art at all, it was karate. And it was always the more athletic kids or the really smart kids. Everybody thinks it's karate. <laughs> they, Everybody thinks every martial art is karate, kung fu, or taekwondo. Yes. <laughs> Just <True>. saying. <laughs> so true. <laughs> but one thing I think that set me up for becoming uh, a NIMPO student was the fact that I was endlessly fascinated with ninjas and movies. And even with the old Japanese movies where they did the dubbing in English and every strike had a snapping sound and, you know, psh, 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 psh. my brother and I would uh, mock them. However, I was secretly thinking, that is so cool. But other kids do that, not me. And so it took me all the way to, let's see. Well, it was the, the time that I watched Steph test. Steph, yeah, like uh, my, I don't know, what was it, my seventh cue? Um, I believe so. Yeah. Right. So she had asked me to watch her test, and she would often invite a family member or somebody to watch her test to make it a little more, shall we say, exciting? I don't know really? if exciting is the word I'd use. Terrifying? For some reason, I like to put extra pressure on myself. 
I don't know why. Because why not? Glutton for punishment, maybe? Glutton for punishment, yeah, <laughs> probably. So there she was, the glutton for punishment out there. And I'm sitting there, middle-aged homeschool mom, watching, supporting, being that good best friend. And finding myself drawn in. I wasn't merely sitting on a stool behind a uh, counter. I felt like I was kind of out there on the mat with her. What? No, no, no. It's other kids and it's TV. But there's Steph out there. Who's Mm -hmm. also a middle-aged homeschooling (laughs) mom. (laughs) That helped. You know, the fact that you weren't a teenage guy made you a little more relatable. So I'm watching her test and test quite well. And then I started thinking, oh, she can do it. I can do it. What? What? Me? And I carried that, but I kept it under wraps for a little while. I thought, well, let me think about this because I can be a little impulsive. So I thought, no, let me think about this. Um, Let me find out a little bit more. And I just couldn't get it off my mind. And finally, I started to talk to Steph. And she said, well, the person to talk to is this guy over here. And his name was Jose. And I already knew who he was. I was not a dojo cho at that time. Right, right. Let's put it in perspective. So this was, let me see, it was around 2019. Um, I would say probably about the spring-ish of 2019, And what's funny was, I already knew who this guy was. I didn't realize he studied a martial art, but I had seen him at church, and I already could see how he interacted with others. I already had a respect for him. And so when he agreed to interview me, um, we only talked about it. And when he said, I think this will be a good fit, I can't even describe the thrill of that. It was a childhood dream that I never allowed myself to have. And since I started in September of 2019, I've learned a lot. I've grown a lot. And as Rochelle mentioned, oh, it is so humbling. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing this. Um, There's always something new, basically in every class. And also going back to the basics which sometimes you think, oh, I've got this. No, I forgot. Okay, I need to set myself to learn this. And the continual humbling and the continually opening the mind, you know, opening my mind to learn, to absorb. It's been, it's been great. Yeah. And as Rochelle said, you know, I could see myself doing this the rest of my life. And I didn't think that yeah. at first. But now yeah. I can't imagine not doing it. Right. There's a funny thing about the martial arts is once you get into it, You kind of don't want to stop. I don't really understand people who get to black belt and decide that that's it. Because really, black belt is just the beginning of the rest of your life. And, you know, the the things that came before are basically the standards, the uh, basics of what you need to learn to be able to do any of the black belt stuff. So... Anyway, so thanks for sharing, you guys, about your NIMPO journey and how we're all connected. We do all train yeah. together. Mm-hmm. Yes, we do. Rochelle's still my student. Yeah. I haven't scared yes. her away. <laughs> she she still shows back. up. <laughs> Three years later, she's still walking through the door. And, you know, it must be interesting living with your sensei. Very interesting. <laughs> well, I do try to separate the two. Oh, definitely. I mean, <laughs> Rochelle can, of course, attest to there's regular everyday Stephanie that we hang out, we joke with, we we laugh, we pun, make our eyes roll. And then there's... <laughs> That's my job, apparently. <laughs> yes, and the side eye. Yes, and the side eye, I was going to say. Yes, and a then, lot of side eye. <laughs> well, there's something that happens. So as we're getting ready to start class, Stephanie starts to shift. Not there. into a monster. No, we're I'm not, not talking... Whole. Okay, let's let's clarify this. We're not talking about shapes shape shifting. <laughs> She's not a shape shifter. However, there's a transformation that starts 
right around the time she starts to put her gi top on. And then once the black belt is on, Stephanie Sensei is in the house. Yeah, I, I have a Sensei hat that I have to put on. It's a, but I only wear it in the dojo most of the time. But I will say that without her being my Sensei, I don't think I would be able to stick with this. She has a sensitivity and understanding that a lot of people might not experience with their Sensei because it's hard to transition to something that humbles you consistently and hard to stick with it. People don't like to be challenged. So I imagine if there wasn't a sensitivity there and understanding, I don't think it would have, I don't think I would have stuck with it, honestly. Yeah, but the sensitivity is not just for you because you're my sister. I know. <laughs> it's there for anybody, really, who wants to learn because I know how difficult this martial art can be. Having That's gone true. through quite a bit of the hard stuff. So let's go ahead and move on. Uh, we sure. started a company uh, for women's self-defense a little while back. I'd say it was January 2019 or was, 2018. Yeah, I was trying to remember when the beta test was. Yeah, I'm not even counting I think that. that was, yeah, well, I was trying to go from there. It seems like that was like January of I think it was January 2019. I said, hey, guys. Yeah. It's you want to start a women's self defense company? <laughs> yes. And you're like, uh, uh what? maybe. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's think about this. We <laughs> decided to go for it, and we opened our doors, so to speak, mm -hmm. in July of 2019. We rented a space at a church in Hocassin, Delaware, um, which was great. It was a gymnasium, so there was lots of space. The not great part was having to set up and break down every single time. Yes. <laughs> and haul the mats up into this little attic space. <laughs> yeah. Good times. No matter what time of year it was, it was hot. It was always hot up, up there. Up there in that, up the top of the stairs. <laughs> Thankfully, we didn't have to spend too much time there. Right. Um, and then um, the pandemic hit and we had to figure out how to keep going with self-defense classes. Um from March until I'm going to guess September is when I opened up my living room. <laughs> yes. I yes. At the same that. time I opened up my living room, basically training happened in my living room because either spaces were too expensive to rent or mm -hmm. people weren't renting because of the pandemic. Right. Yeah. So I opened up my living room and we can rearrange some of the furniture and make a nice <laughs> decent sized space for about four people. Right. right. Yep. We made it work. We made it work. And we kept that up for almost two years. Yeah, it was, it was quite a chunk of, of time. And so mm -hmm. we found the place mm -hmm. we're at right now, which is on Main Street at another church, mm -hmm. who's renting a somewhat small room to us, which is fine. And so we basically been running classes there for the last, I guess, almost two years, because we've been there almost two years. Right. Yeah. So we wanted to, and this is the main part of why we're even doing this podcast. We want to provide information to people about caring for themselves, about thinking of themselves in such a fashion that they want to defend themselves. That they want to put some effort into learning some combative techniques, some avoiding techniques, situational awareness, etc. And we've been talking for a while about starting a podcast, but what were we going to talk about? <laughs> right. And mm -hmm. so we decided that there's a mama bear in all of us mm -hmm. that wants to speak and wants to train other people to think about their situations to know what their options are and to make a difference in people's lives so Rochelle why don't you go ahead and give us some information about why you're wanting to do this podcast to give a brief history um grew up in an abusive home my mother was an addict and I was abused in every almost every possible way from being very very young all the way up until I was well, into my young adulthood and have spent, since I was about 22 years old, have been in therapy. And I remember when I was about 
28, I came to terms with the fact that I had been traumatized. And I prayed and asked God at that point. I actually said to God, I don't want this to become... I had understood what beauty for ashes means at that point. And I wanted this thing that happened to me to be made into something beautiful. And that stayed with me through my whole adult life. And fast forward to now, the more I observe the world, the more I see people hurting and needing help. And while our Mama Bear Initiative doesn't exactly address a trauma, it doesn't exactly address trauma, it does address the need for awareness to prevent things from happening that can harm you and your family. And there can be healing found here too. I don't know exactly how yet, but I believe that. But protection and awareness is so important, especially with the way the world is going these days. And knowing how to protect yourself, knowing how to protect your family is so important. We just never know what could happen. And a lot of people think it won't happen until it happens to them. And then it may be too late. I'm really surprised by how few people feel like they know how to say no. Yep. Or how to set a boundary in a situation. Yeah, that's or huge. get tied up with wanting to be polite. Right? Because sometimes true. we think that mm-hmm. if we're polite enough, which I believe is part of the fight, flight, freeze, fawn. So this right. would be fawning. If I'm mm-hmm. polite enough in the situation, maybe I'll get out of it okay. Yep. Which often isn't the case. So, Evelyn, why don't you give us a... a rundown of why you're doing this podcast? Um, There are a number of reasons. I think one of the biggest things that started this for me was when I, I was actually in prison and I was standing in what's called yard only. I was out, out there by myself. So I was outside in this prison yard and I started to think about the women who were in there And I started to realize how lost and broken they were, how no one expects to be in prison, and how as I had gotten to know some of them, I realized that they were in in lifestyles that they didn't think they could get out of. And they didn't know how to live strong and healthy and get on their feet and say no to things that would hurt them and how to protect themselves or even care about themselves. And I was just overwhelmed out there and I just started just crying. And it was from very deep inside, just a a concern. And it wasn't just for the girls in prison. It was even for the guys. And then it extended out to those who We're just walking around in everyday life, out in the world and just lost and broken. Some didn't even realize that this is just a normal lifestyle for them to be afraid, to feel trapped, to be basically victims of their lives. Realizing that, and I think it also helps that I'm a mother, um, I want to equip I want to teach women, girls, whoever comes our way, you can have a better life. You can care for yourself the way you deserve to be cared for. And you can, you know, set boundaries and enforce them so that you don't allow others to just walk all over you. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Yeah, that's really important you know um that goes back to what Rochelle was saying about making choices so that you're not being taken advantage of the whole setting the boundaries and other things that are important being aware of what's around you who's around you picking up on physical vocal maybe even emotional cues from other people what they might actually be thinking their what their intentions are So for myself, I, you know, like I said, I started my martial art in 2016 and I have been in therapy from, 
also an abusive childhood. Um, as many possible ways as you can think of to be abused, I've experienced it. And I started into therapy in my 30s. I mean, I'm sorry, in my 20s. Um, so I'd already had a bunch of healing by that point. And I didn't get into the martial art to get healing. I didn't know that was a thing. But when I got in there, I started getting triggered by things like grappling with a guy and getting choked out, you know, which is part of the technique. And that had an effect on me. And since it had an effect on me, of course, my drive is to overcome it. And, you know, I would go to therapy and talk about it and figure out ways to deal with it. But also I started to have success in the martial art and how I was dealing with other people. And mostly it was guys. Most of my training's been done with men. I didn't really have a lot of women that I got to work with. So generally speaking, um, I got to see what it was like to deal with male strength. And, you know, as a woman, I have to figure out how to overcome it. You know, women can fight men, just not strength for strength or, you know, fist for fist. It has to be smarter than that. Right. So as I was working through things and learning how to overcome, I was also getting some healing and some empowering. And I realized about a year, year and a half in that this could be converted into training for women, self-defense training specifically. And I came up with this beta test that Evelyn mentioned earlier, <laughs> yes, which was a four hour seminar. I accomplished my goals. The women felt empowered. Um, although what I think about self-defense now is very different than what I thought about it then. What I want people to learn now is very different. And how I go about teaching it is very different. Obviously, I have some experience by now. So um, I s invited Evelyn and Rochelle to start this company with me. And we started the training. And um, they've come quite a long way in their own self-defense training. We work with women in a variety of settings. Um, and I know for Rochelle, Evelyn, and myself, we've all experienced healing from it in various ways. So the same with Rochelle and Evelyn, I want to get my voice out there. I want to say the things that I wish I could say to anyone if I was to meet them and hear about their experiences, the things that I want to teach people to think about, and also to have the strength to stand up against someone who's being aggressive or manipulative or any of the things that you know, women experience, men experience, children experience. It all comes back to what do you think about yourself? And I want to teach people how to think about themselves. So here we are starting yes, this here we are. journey. Yep. And hoping that we can make a difference. Yes. And trusting that the listeners can get something out of what we want to say and use it in their own lives in a way that's positive and empowering. So we want to thank you for listening to our welcome audio. Our welcome, whatever you, I don't know, what do you call this? <laughs> uh, our welcome our podcast episode. Welcome. There, there we go. go. Our welcome is. episode. Uh, welcome. The welcome episode. <laughs> welcome to the welcome e episode. Thank us you for three joining us today. Can never remember a thing. <laughs> I think what, I need what to are post we doing? It. I forget. I need to post it. Why am I holding this microphone? <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Anyways, do you guys have any final thoughts you want to add before we close this up? I think the biggest goal I have in mind is to bring awareness to something that seems like it should be obvious, but for some reason isn't to most people. Hmm. Yeah. And one thing that, that really strikes me with all of this is there is hope. You don't have to be a victim. No matter how bad this world gets, no matter how high the crime rate goes, there is hope and you have options. And uh, we can teach you those.
All right. Well, thanks again for tuning in and uh, look forward to new podcast episodes as they come forward. Mm-hmm.